Hey guys, welcome back to the new Middle East. Dalton Thomas here in the Golan Heights. I'm with my friend and brother today, Joel Richardson, again. Uh, this is Joel's second uh, time on in the series. If you missed the first one, I want to encourage you to watch that, the one with Joel, uh, and then to catch up. In the first one, we did kind of a big picture overview, the goal of this series of looking at the center of the earth, at the crossroads of history, and uh, part of the, the frame of reference for me is that I'm in the Golan, up in northern Israel, right on the Syria, Lebanese, Israeli border. And uh, we are in lockdown. It looks like lockdown is going to be progressively lifting, but Israel has been in a pretty uh, complicated situation, like many countries. But going back into another lockdown uh, has been quite challenging and difficult for the country. So. Uh, no one can actually move except for going to pharmacies and grocery stores and the country is, which was crazy because the high holidays just happened. You had Yom Kippur and Sukkot and it was bizarre to be here with, which normally, you know, the high holidays in Israel is, it's a big deal. It's the biggest part of the year. And it was, the country is frozen and silent. It's like this hushed, it is, it's been a very bizarre experience. So we decided, let's look at the, this is a moment, this paused hush is kind of a moment to reflect and in some sense take stock and, and seek the Lord um, and also look at the map and look at what's happening on the earth in this generation and look at the center of the earth at the crossroads of history. Today, we're going to be looking at a, a very important uh, piece of the, the puzzle. Uh, we had uh, Seth Franceman on a couple days ago. Seth, I remember him saying one time that uh, the Middle East is like a jigsaw puzzle where none of the puzzle pieces fit. It's uh, the pieces of the puzzle. It's, it's, it, it's not quite, you know, it, they're awkward sized pieces and things don't really quite fit. And one of the, the most important, I think, subjects of the new Middle East is the whole issue of Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Peninsula. That's what we're going to be looking at today, Saudi Arabia. Part of it's going to, the way I'd like to approach it, Joel, is just kind of maybe start with the personal and then move our way to geopolitical in the sense that, uh, you know, I know you've had quite a, a journey in getting connected with Saudi and more than just a geopolitical analyst way or more than just a prophecy way, but it's actually become a real uh, personal part of your life and has really um, taken a good chunk of your time and energy and uh, emotional and intellectual uh, energy over the last number of years. So I think it would be good if maybe we start there and then move our way to things like the Abraham Accords, talking about the, the, the new dynamic in the Middle East with the, the so-called moderate Sunni world moving closer and closer into a relationship with, with the state of Israel, with the Jewish people, um, and, and really taking a hardline stance against another large uh, contingent of the Muslim world uh, uh, namely Iran and Iran's proxy. So I think that's kind of the roadmap of where I'd like to take it today, but I'd like people to hear, because I know a lot of your, your journey and story, and I've kind of got sucked into it myself, which has been a glorious experience to be able to, you know, touch the whole Saudi um, thing and, and, and to go to Saudi with you and to, and to begin to really see firsthand the evolution of one of the most uh, influential and pivotal players in the Middle East, namely the, the Saudis, it's, it's been quite a journey and we're only at the beginning of it. You know, uh, you and I were on the phone last night talking about uh, future plans with some of the things that we have coming down the pipeline where Saudi is concerned. And I thought, you know, I'd like people to kind of maybe feel, I know when I heard you first start talking about it from a personal standpoint, made me really uh, care about it in a much more, uh, I don't know, intimate way may not be the right word, but it's not like looking at it from a microscope, you know, we're not looking at it, it there, it's real people, it's real emotions, it's real stories. And I think when we connect with story, you're not talking, you're not just connecting with political analyst stuff, you know, so maybe to kick things off, just start with maybe how, you know, why is Saudi Arabia important to you and how has the Lord kind of pulled you into the story of this incredible country, Saudi Arabia? Yeah, I mean, there's no question that if we're talking the New Middle East, um, Saudi Arabia is one of the most significant uh, 
kingdoms, nations, that's in the process of a drastic transformation. So there's no question that Saudi Arabia is huge. I mean, of course, everyone knows that Saudi Arabia is the Saudi royal family. Uh, they are the stewards of the two holy mosques, uh, the two most sacred cities and locations in Islam, of course, Mecca and Medina, and then third would be Al-Quds, Jerusalem, right? So, I mean, this really is the center. It's not just the center of the Islamic world today. It's the womb. You know, Mecca, Medina, this area, um, Yathrib in, uh, in Arabic, this is the womb that gave birth to Islam, which then, of course, exploded and pretty much is the dominant uh, religious force throughout the Middle East. Okay, so this is the heart. Saudi Arabia is the heart of the Islamic world. And really for all of last century, um, up until really just last year, the kingdom was closed to foreign visitors apart from those that are working in the country. So unless you have a work visa, you can't just go to Saudi Arabia. You can't just visit. And, you know, you and I have had a chance to see most of the Middle East. Um, we've visited, I've visited most of the countries throughout the Middle East. Just out of my own personal interest, I've actually always wanted to see Mecca. I would love to visit Mecca. Of course, unless you're Muslim, you're not allowed to go. But I've always sort of had this interest in this draw. Well, as a teacher, as someone who is, I'll say, part of the evangelical uh, an itinerant minister. I'm part of the circuit and often talking about biblical prophecy in the Middle East, people are constantly sending me stuff, emails, sending me pictures and this type of thing. Well, one of the things that people have often asked me about, they say, what do you think about this particular mountain up in the Tabuk province? This is the northwest province of Saudi Arabia. I'm up there close to the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula uh, Southern Jordan and, and Israel down there by Elat. I call it, I call Elat the Florida of Israel, pretty much the Southern beach town down there on the Red Sea. And they've shown me pictures of this mountain, Jebel al Laws, which is up there in the Dubuk province. And they said, you know, so-and-so, and you know, these different people have visited it. They think it's the real Mount Sinai. What do you think about this rock? What do you think about this? And I would just look at it and say, look, this is not my purview. I mean, this is not my specialty. I don't know. I don't know what to say. It would require a tremendous amount of research and so forth. But strangely, each time that people showed me these pictures, just something rose up in me. And I don't know how to explain it other than to say it was like just a prayer that rose up that was almost foreign. Like, where did that come from? And I would just say, Lord, I ask that you would just get me into Saudi Arabia. I want to go see that mountain. And I really didn't have a tremendous amount of personal interest. That's why it's kind of unusual. And, um, and this happened a few times over the years. Well, uh, step back, I guess about three years now. I'm lost in terms of time, but we're here toward the end of 2020. And I guess this was 2017 or 2018. But a friend of mine, um, I'm on the board of uh, his ministry. He works in Albania. He said, hey, have you seen these pictures? So now this was probably, you know, the fifth time that people have come. Have you seen these pictures? He said, a friend of mine was just here at Jabal al -Az. And I said, oh, that's amazing. I've seen that over the years. And then I said, um, you know, could, could your friend get me into Saudi Arabia on a work visa? I could come in and do some promotional photography work uh, for his company. And he said, oh, absolutely. He can get you a, a, a visa, no problem. And from a spiritual perspective, I will just say, you know, I'm not a real, um, I'm not very sensitive spiritually uh, when it comes to, uh, I'll just use the term spiritual warfare. You know, um, my wife is very sensitive to the things of the spirit. I just tend to bulldog my way through life and sort of grunt and I don't, I don't pick up on these things, but it was literally when he texted me back and said he can get you in it was like I immediately just felt this incredibly heavy, heavy uh, presence kind of settle over me. And I just said, what in the world is this? I mean, it was tangible. I could just feel this kind of resistance. It was very unusual. And that, that continued, I would say, for really the past few years. But it was really that next several months was 
heavy, heavy. And I won't get into all the details, but uh, within a few weeks, my friend had a horrible accident. He broke seven ribs, stuck one of them into one of his lungs. I mean, almost died. And there was just sort of calamity after catastrophe of, of different things coming up that didn't allow us to get in. But finally, uh, we were able a few months later to get in. My friend recovered. He's kind of an animal. And we got in, I guess it was... Um, uh, April, May. So a few, I guess this is three years ago now, April, May, we got in and, um, went up there to do some camping and exploration and to see Jebel al -Laws. And I'll just say that, um, once this opportunity came up, I started pouring through all of the incredibly contentious literature and books and articles academic articles, popular articles um, about Jebel al laws um, Within the field, let me just say this. Um, so basically, people believe this is the real Mount Sinai. I don't know if I already said this. Um, they believe it's the real biblical Mount Sinai. Well, within the field of Exodus studies, among scholars that have dedicated their lives to study the Exodus, Mount Sinai, there are a handful of different mountains that are candidates, potential Mount Sinai candidates. Um, it's, in, it's incredibly contentious, but this particular mountain is by and large, has popularly been mocked, scorned and belittled by quite a few scholars. There have been a handful of uh, very prominent scholars and um, academics that have kind of gotten on the train and believed that this could be a legitimate candidate, but often it's scorned and mocked. After working through this for a good part of uh, 2017 and after visiting, I became wholeheartedly convinced that this is the real Mount Sinai. I don't care if you're dealing with the traditional evidence, the historical evidence, the geological evidence, the archeological evidence, the petroglyph evidence, just the layout of the mountain itself, the location, on and on and on, down the list, everything points to this being the real Mount Sinai. And I became fascinated by this. So, I mean, for what it's worth, this has the potential to be literally the single greatest sacred or biblical archeological site in history. I mean, it, it, this is really, really huge, but it's just been sitting out there in the desert um, you know, some Bedouins out there just, you know, taking care of their goats and smoking cigarettes and they get their sort of country homes that they go out, you know, on the weekends and, and spend time in. And they're sort of aware of this because, you know, there are these various Westerners that keep coming out to check it out. But it's just sitting out there for anyone to go see. Um, and it's been hidden behind, I'll say, the Iron Curtain of the closed uh, borders of Saudi Arabia. So this is fascinating. Well, I had a chance to see that. Well, then I guess last year, um, I was blessed to lead the first Christian tour in history into Saudi Arabia. We entered in two weeks after the country opened uh, for the first time in history to tourism, to where they opened up just free tourism visas. So we talk about the transformation of the Middle East. We talk about the changing Saudi Arabia. Obviously, a few years ago, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman bursts onto the scene and just gets the media attention um, you know, all over the world. And he's talking about drastically reforming the country. So um, eliminating some of what the Western world would see as these really draconian Islamic laws uh, you know, women can't drive. Well, now women can drive. Um, concerts, you know, you can have mixed genders, mixed sex concerts where males and females can go to the same uh, music, con like this type of thing. That was unheard of. And he's, he's really changing the country um, in, in a lot of ways that are pretty drastic for those that live in the country. Well, one of the things he did is he opened the country to, to tourism. So suddenly it's open. So just after the tour, um, I met up with you and a handful of other guys, and we had the chance to hike up the mountain and actually camp. So that was actually just about a year ago, because it was Sukkot. We camped on the top of the mountain the last night of Sukkot, which was unplanned, which was really just, I don't know any other word to use other than magical. I mean, it was, 
it was just a beautiful, beautiful night in every way. And, um, and in the midst of all of this, there's this, there's this other huge factor, which is that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is talking about building this mega city, this project called Neom. Um, this has been in discussion for a few years now. The whole area up there is filled with engineers, European engineers all over the world who are laying the infrastructure uh, for this mega city, which is for those who are not familiar, I mean, most, most are, uh, just think Dubai on steroids. They want to build a mega city project, which would have everything from a city to all kinds of natural um, land to uh, solar powered, you know, the most technologically advanced cut it, cutting edge city in the history of mankind, cutting edge biotech, science, robotics, all kinds of real bold stuff. They're talking about having an artificial moon. <laughs> I don't know what that looks like, a glow in the dark beach. You know, you see all these different things that they're talking about. Well, right in the middle of this neom is Jebel al Laz, is this mountain. And so on one hand, I'm convinced that the Saudis are well aware of this and um, they respect it and it's sacred to them as well uh, in Islam. So both Jewish, Christian and Islam, it's very special, it's historical, it's mentioned, referenced uh, sort of vaguely in the Quran, but it's well known in Islamic history, Islamic tradition, that this is the land of Midian and biblically speaking, Jethro, Moses's father-in-law, the Quran calls him Shu'aib. And um, so you've got all this developing. So here is, again, the crown prince who is wanting to diversify the economy of the country. He wants to build this mega city, and they're sitting on, again, arguably, the single greatest sacred archaeological site in history. So on one hand, it's sacred to them. On the other hand, there's the potential for tremendous revenue. You think about it, Israel, uh, I guess last year had 4.6 million tourists, I believe, um, I might be wrong. It might even be as much as 6 million, but you know, a few million tourists, 60% of which are Christians or 67% of which are Christians. And you think of the potential for uh, Christian and even ultimately down the road, Jewish tourism and Muslim tourism to this mountain, if they preserve and protect it and turn it into a genuine um, archeological park, which is a massive, massive area. Um, the potential for tourism and revenue and the exchange of cultures as millions of Westerners and Christians, people from all over the world, all over the world come in and rub shoulders with the Saudis. They were, everyone that we've met when we were there were incredibly hospitable and friendly. We had all positive experiences. Uh, obviously, the Saudi royal family are dealing with a lot of politically sensitive issues here as there is a percentage of the population that is pretty, you know, radical um, and this type of thing. And there is that, there is that reality. But everyone that we met were, were just very uh, classic Middle East, hospitable, friendly. Um, we had really good experiences. So just the potential down the road in the, the potential down the road for, as I said, cultural exchange for dr drastic, I mean, transforming biblical exodus studies um, for, you know, sort of rewriting some of the Bible atlases uh, versus the traditional Mount Sinai site down there in the Sinai Peninsula. I mean, there's just so much. But so having been pulled into the swirl of all this, um, it has been, it's, it has legitimately been life transforming to, to see the evidence that the foundation of the story of redemption, the foundation of the biblical narrative is just sitting out there. For any bozo to walk up and see and here's all the evidence and uh, and you and I are working on some projects some film projects that will highlight this um, we won't get into all the details there that stuff we'll be talking about down the road but really uh, exciting exciting stuff that's that's opening up so I'll leave it right there and kind of um, let you uh, choose which direction we go from here yeah, uh, speaking of future film, uh, future, future film projects, tomorrow, all day, 
for uh, 24 hours will be a day of solidarity with the church in Iran. And we're going to be uh, watching Sheep Among Wolves Volume 2 around the world uh, and reflecting on, on what the Lord is speaking to the global body through the Iranian church. So if you were not aware of that and you missed that memo and you're just hearing this now, uh, there's more details of this, other videos and things on the FAI app that you can find and we want to invite you to join us it's going to be a i think a, 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 a powerful day we're going to cap the day off at 9 p.m eastern time with a short live stream event where we're going to announce the title and the details of our next film which is about to release um, we're going to show some of the we're going to show some of the stuff um, we're not going to get into too much detail because we're very very close to the release itself but there are some things that we wanted to share this will be exclusively on the fai app so go get it if you don't have it if you do hop on the fai app uh, just before 9 p.m eastern standard time and then the live stream event will begin it's going to be very brief very short um, and to the point um, but we wanted to we wanted to do it live and we wanted to share some things with you it's very exciting um, as this film is being released, uh, we're immediately beginning uh, production, as in immediately, as in we've already started actually, production on a number of films and not just films that are going to be uh, really emphasizing, focusing on not only Saudi Arabia and Mount Sinai, but also uh, the story of the Exodus in some ways that are going to be, I think, pretty pretty mind-blowing um so more on that tomorrow night so join us for that let's let's shift gears Joel, and talk about maybe the politics of, of where things are at right now because on the, the abraham accords you know it was the united arab emirates so if, if you're not familiar with the the map of the middle east you have the arabian peninsula and the biggest country in the arabian peninsula is saudi arabia then you have a little a little corner pocket of these you know, peppered countries in the UAE, and you have Oman and Yemen, you have Jordan. And Saudi is the biggest player in the Arabian Peninsula. And the smallest players are, in terms of size of land mass, is the UAE. So the UAE and Israel signed on September 15th, brokered by the United States and the Trump administration, what's called the Abraham Accords. The Abraham Accords are normalizing ties between the UAE and the Israelis, which is wildly significant on, on so many levels. Israel only has a formal tr peace treaty with two countries in the Middle East, which is Jordan and Egypt. And those are not exactly, uh, I wouldn't call those normalization deals. Those were, let's stop fighting each other, which is different. The normalization deal is let's build something beautiful together in the Middle East. That's the narrative in terms of the UAE and the Israeli mentality as well, which is let's, let's fly to each other's countries, let's develop technology, let's develop healthcare, let's develop, let's open up tourism. You guys come visit the mosque and they're saying, hey, we'll build some synagogues here. Let's, you know, they were celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles in the UAE this last week, which is really amazing to see the, to, to see that image in downtown in the middle of the city to have the you know a Jewish feast being celebrated it's a new Middle East you know so what's interesting is that Saudi it wasn't involved in the beginning stages of the rollout of the Abraham Accord so maybe Joel give us a backdrop on maybe the the history of Israel Saudi relations and then why potentially why the Saudis weren't involved in the, at least on the surface, out in the open, weren't involved in Abraham, of course. And what do you think we'll see in the future? Meaning, do you think we're going to see normalization with Saudi? And if so, what are the implications of that? I know there's a lot of, I think I just asked like 17 questions, but, you know, Saudi is inconspicuous in this whole thing, but behind the scenes, very, 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 very involved, no doubt. So maybe give us a bit of a historical rundown, maybe just to you know, go from past, present, future, from your perspective, where it's come from, where we are, and where's, where do you think this is all going in the immediate future? Yeah. So again, yeah, you laid it out. The Arabian Peninsula is dominated in terms of 
which kingdom or uh, nation controls the majority of the land mass, the majority is controlled by Saudi Arabia. As I already mentioned, they also control Mecca and Medina. So because they are the, the, the stewards, the custodians of these sacred cities, which of course is, this, Mecca is the single most visited spot city in the world. You think of all the, the Muslim pilgrims that come there each year. So there's tremendous influence there. Um, the UAE is relatively small in terms of land mass, but in terms of economic power and influence, the UAE is pretty profound. The Saudis are still the most important player on the Arabian Peninsula and throughout the Islamic world. They're a, they're a significant uh, influence and player, but the UAE is not insignificant, despite the fact that it's small. It's a very significant player. So as you said, uh, the UAE, and it's uh, the UAE and Bahrain, right? They're both part of the accords. So you've got these two, Bahrain, again, just a little uh, island nation that's just over there uh, off of, you've got Dammam, Kobar, that's where most of the uh, expats live that are part of the oil industry over there in the Eastern oil fields. Bahrain is an island and it's a bit more liberal in terms of laws. Um, the joke is that's where everyone drives from Saudi Arabia over to Bahrain to kind of party and, uh, you know, this type of thing or engage in activity that's um, maybe illegal in Saudi Arabia. Okay, so you've got the UAE and, the bah and Bahrain. Well, behind the scenes, behind the scenes, the Saudis have been in reproachment with uh, the Israelis in terms of economic development, as well as security. Security has been a key factor in all of this. Obviously, you've got the looming threat of Iran, the greatest. So again, for those that are not familiar, Iran represents the greatest Islamic Shia, Shia Muslim power in the world. And Saudi Arabia really represents the Sunni the heart of the Sunni Muslim world, okay? So Islam is broken up between two primary sects. You've got a few handful of other smaller sects. The Sunnis are about 85% of the Islamic world. The Shia are about 15%. But Iran really is a rogue regime that has been openly making threats um, for years. And in their vision, in the Iranian vision, they envision a day when they will essentially conquer the Sunni world. So they kind of have this eschatology, this, this religious vision of conquering the whole Middle East. And they've been doing that. Uh, I mean, they've been working toward that end through their proxies, effectively taking over Lebanon through Hezbollah, effectively taking over Iraq uh, through their proxies there. And uh, just all over the Middle East, they use these junkyard dog um, proxies, uh, puppets, and these sort of um, militias and different groups to take control over different uh, other countries. Okay, so Israel is very threatened by Iran. Saudi Arabia is very threatened by Iran. So that alone causes there to be some uh, reproachment, and that's been taking place behind the scenes. Now, on the surface, the Saudis are saying, no, we're not going to enter into similar um, normalization such as UAE. And here is my guess in terms of why that is the case. Well, Saudi Arabia is controlled by the Saudi royal family. And this is a family which over the years continues to multiply. And you've got so many different factions and branches and families within the larger family. And uh, you talk about politics, you talk about uh, family feud, so to speak. Saudi Arabia is very, very sensitive politically. Um, there are different factions that really want to maintain this real Wahhabi, Salafi Wahhabi purist um, version of, of what most Westerners would consider radical Islam. You have others that want to modernize and, um, and reform the country so as to welcome in Westerners and again, you know, Neom and all of these different things. Well, that is seen as a threat to, you know, certain families and factions and so forth. So you have even those that are in power, such as the crown prince, you have, they're in a very sensitive political situation. Now, the, 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 the event that everyone is waiting for 
is the death of the king. Of course, I'm not sure how old the king is now. He's in his 80s. When the king passes on, then the crown prince will become the king. And again, crown prince, he's only, I guess, what is he, 35 at this point? Is he even 35? He's a, he's a young guy. Um, this, this is someone who could potentially be the king of the country for as long as he's alive. And again, he has this really, um, what is considered to be a pretty radical vision of, of reform. So a lot is waiting on the passing of his father and to where he is finally established as king. Until then, you constantly hear rumors of different efforts from within the family to assassinate the crown prince and, and different Saudis that I talked to, you know, they're really scared. There really is a fear within the country because the country can change. It can turn on a dime. If something happens, such as the assassination, God forbid, of the crown prince, everything could change overnight. Everything could just completely turn 180 from where it has been heading. So things are sensitive right now until there is a bit more of a stabilization of powers. And my, my guess is that once that happens, once the crown prince is, uh, once the father passes and he becomes king, and establishes his security apparatus, and he's, you know, safe and established, then we probably will. I would guess that we will see Saudi Arabia um, enter into something similar to what UAE did. It, it may not look exactly the same. It might not be quite as kumbaya behind the scenes, again, in terms of security, in terms of various economic agreements. I think that's already happening. But in terms of the, the public face, I think we will see something significant. You know, it's probably worth mentioning, even, even prophetically, just outside of just the analysis of what we see in the news, you look at, for example, the prophecy of Ezekiel 38, 39, the battle of Gog, Magog. Um, this is a huge looming sort of end time prophecy in the Old Testament. Every Jew is familiar with Gog, uh, Gog and Magog, is you have this, this little contingent of voices that protest this invasion of Israel. Because that's what it's talking about. It's talking about an invasion of Israel led by Gog from Magog, which is most likely Turkey. And you have this, this contingency of protest, and it's Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish. This is who are listed together. And they are protesting the invasion. Well, interestingly, Sheba and Dedan, that's northwest Saudi Arabia. So here you have thousands of years ago, 2,500 uh, years ago, you have this prophecy in the Bible that says in the last days there would be an invasion of several nations from the Middle East and North Africa that would invade and attack Israel. And you have a prophecy that Saudi Arabia, or at least some of the voices from within Saudi Arabia, are protesting the invasion. And that's interesting. That's interesting because that suggests that the Bible says prophetically that Saudi Arabia will not be part of this coming anti-Christ coalition, this coming anti-Israel coalition. Rather, they'll be friendly. And so it's interesting to see modern geopolitics aligning with what the Bible seems to suggest. Um, but again, even apart from prophecy in the Bible, things are definitely moving in that direction. Now, how, maybe explain the, the layout of the Middle East in terms of the broad, you know, if we're talking in terms of the analogy of a soccer team here, who, who's on the team, so to speak, of the Saudis? Because we have in a very interesting axis emerging now with Turkey kind of, uh, you know, rising. Who, uh, for people who are not really, you know, they, they look at this big confusing map and they hear lots of names and uh, acronyms for different political parties and everything. Kind of a simple overview. Who's in the Saudi orbit? Who's against the Saudi orbit, just on a basic political level? Yeah, if we keep it in very simple terms, and the way that I usually do this is through the paradigm or through the framework of Daniel 11, which is Daniel the prophet, chapter 11. He uses this historical conflict between the Seleucids in the north and the Ptolemies in the south, essentially Turkey, Syria, Iraq in the north, and then Egypt in the south. And there was this historical conflict between the two. Well, Daniel uses that historical conflict 
as a framework for envisioning the layout of the Middle East in the last days. And so you could say, uh, and he calls them the king of the north and the king of the south. So let's say the king of the south is Egypt. Again, Egypt being the most populous Arab nation in the world, uh, pushing 90 million Arabs um, and tremendously influenced in that sense. Not only are they the most populous nation, they're also um, the home of Al-Azhar University. So that, let's just say that's kind of the Oxford or the Harvard of the uh, Sunni Islamic world. Okay, so sort of the, the mind, the brain, the academic heart of the Sunni Islamic world. Well, then you have Saudi Arabia in terms of huge influences within the Sunni world. As I have already mentioned, they're the custodians of the two holy cities and the heart of the ancient heart of the Islamic world and the place that everyone goes to to make pilgrimage. Um, and so <clears throat> if we're talking about sort of a king of the south coalition, you've got Egypt, of course, you've got Jordan, which is also slightly uh, friendly to Israel, Israel's neighbor. You could say slightly more Western friendly, slightly more moderate. Egypt, Jordan, well now you have the UAE, Bahrain, I believe that Saudi Arabia will become part of this emerging uh, southern coalition. And you could name a few others. You know, probably Oman is fair to say will be part of this uh, soon. Yemen is a bit of a wild card, obviously. Yemen is a mess right now. Um, but then you have the emerging King of the North coalition. And of course, the King of the North Coalition also overlaps with and aligns with the Ezekiel 38-39 Gog-Magog Coalition. So over the past 15 years, most people would have seen the greatest threat to be Iran, and they continue to be a tremendous existential threat. But I've been shouting from the rooftops for years that we have to watch the dark horse, which is Turkey. And no question, you know, I was mocked years ago, but no question Turkey has now emerged as just as significant of a regional threat as Iran. So now you have this emerging Turkey-Iran coalition. Uh, nations such as Qatar, uh, the home of Al Jazeera, are kind of falling into alignment with that coalition. And it really transcends just nations but it also includes ideologies and organizations. So even though Turkey is Sunni and Iran is Shia, they have this sort of unity of being radical and anti-Israel, anti-Western, um, a bit more militant. They both have opposing regional interests, but they're willing to work together because of their mutual hatred of Israel and Saudi Arabia and the United States. Um, but Turkey really is the the uh, Turkish branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, Ikhwan. And so the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, you've got Hamas is the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood has tremendous influence and presence in Egypt and all over the Middle East. And so you could kind of say nations such as Qatar, um, Turkey, Iran, but really they have influence throughout the region. And, um, and they have interests in establishing a greater Turkey uh, throughout the region. So I believe that what we will see in the future is significant Turkish military action. We're already seeing it. They're fomenting all kinds of trouble over there in Armenia and Azerbaijan. They've invaded Syria. They're essentially invading Northern Iraq and the Kurdish ter territories of Northern Iraq. They've been bombing them for years they've got Turkish military on the ground. Again, a year ago we saw the invasion of, um, of northern Syria. They're threatening Greece, they're threatening Europe, they're thumbing their nose at the West, and so this is, and Israel, and this is sort of the emerging paradigm, is the Turkish-Iranian king of the north axis, again with clearly um, Qatar, and other nations, and then the emerging more Western friendly, more moderate bloc in the South. So Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the UAE, Israel, and uh, the United States, and a handful of others. That's a helpful overview. 
Well, bro, thank you for this. Um, again, thanks for the do another session and, and taking the time out to do this. I always appreciate your clarity on all of this. I know everyone else does watching it as well. So guys, tomorrow, join us for a day of solidarity with the church in Iran. You say, what does that look like? If, if you're living in a place where you can invite people over to your house, bring people over for a meal and, and show the film and then talk about it together. But if you're in a place where you can't gather like Israel, you get creative with it. You know, maybe get your community and watch it and then maybe have a conversation like this over Zoom with your community and process the implications of the testimony coming out of, uh, the testimony that's coming out of Iran right now. I was talking to, in fact, one of the main, uh, one of the main voices in the film I was talking to him last night, just getting an update on all that's happening in Iran and just feeling, you know, stirred afresh for how much of a fierce testimony that that incredible body of brothers and sisters is providing a, a template, providing an example, providing a way forward that I think is, you know, it's like when you're cutting away in the, uh, the forest, you have to bushwhack your way to, you know, create a path. I think the Iranians have forged a really clear path and have really bushwhacked a way for us that we can really get in behind and follow behind them in this path they've already cleared. And I'm looking right now at the church in the West, which right now is, you know, really struggling in the weeds, trying to figure out where the path is. And I think, you know, looking at the, the confused voices and directions coming out of the West right now and the dominant political spirit that's just, you know, numbing the minds and the hearts of the body of Christ. And you see in Iran is living under actual heavy, heavy persecution, actual heavy, heavy tyrannical hands. They've let, they've cut a path. And so we want to invite you, encourage you to get everyone that, that you can together for this, even if it's just your family or if you're, you know, like us, we can't really travel. If we were, we put up a big speaker system and big old screen somewhere and screen it up here in the Golan, but we're, you know, invite everyone we know to come watch it. But alas, we cannot do that. So we're gonna, we're gonna uh, get more creative with it and be a bit more uh, technological like this, doing it over Zoom and connecting with people. So anyway, thank you guys for doing this. And again, join us 9 p.m. Eastern time uh, tomorrow, only on the FAI app. And uh, Joel and I will see you then for the announcement of the new film and some other surprises as well. Thank you guys. Thank you, Joel. Maranatha.